Hidden among the ranches and rolling hills in the northern part of Denton County, Texas, the remains of more than 400 people lie in an overgrown cemetery. And even though it was abandoned and forgotten a long time ago, a few headstones can still be found. But most of the graves in this place never had a marker to begin with. That's because the people who were buried in them were considered to be property, not much different than a horse or a mule. This is where slaves were buried. Hello, my name is Marcus Lloyd. And I'm Michelle Renee. We thank you for joining us. If you are African American, you and I will always be connected to the people whose bodies lie in that cemetery. Our ancestors may have worked alongside of them in the same cotton fields. They could have been bought and sold at the same auction houses or had chains hammered around their necks by the same overseer. Some of them may have even been hunted down by the same slave catcher or whipped by the same master. For almost 250 years, our people were held in bondage. And today, this period of history has come to be known by an ancient Swahili word. It's called the Ma'afa. And it began when the first Africans were shackled to the bottom of a slave ship. But the irony is that it did not end when the slaves were freed. In fact, it hasn't ended yet. And as you're about to see, a hidden racial agenda is keeping the Ma'afa alive into the 21st century. What shall be done with the four million slaves if they are emancipated? This question has been answered and can be answered in many ways. Primarily, it is a question less for man than for God, less for human intellect than for the laws of nature to solve. Our answer is, do nothing with them. Mind your business and let them mind theirs. Your doing with them is their greatest misfortune. They have been undone by your doings, and all they now ask and really have need of at your hands is just to let them alone. Frederick Douglass, 1862. It is the stupidity of man to think that he can do evil, even some monstrous evil, and it won't have any backlash on himself. But of course, it seldom works that way, and the moment he figures that out, he starts looking for a way to avoid the repercussions of what he's done. This is what happened with slavery. In the early 1800s, as it began to look like the end of slavery might be on the horizon, white America started to be concerned that a day of reckoning was coming. The primary fear for the average person was of retribution and insurrection, and that was a reasonable fear. After all, it's illogical to think that you can do to a whole group of people what was done to African Americans and think that they will just take it lying down forever. And of course, there were things like the Nat Turner uprisings. But for the wealthy elite, their fears went beyond things like insurrection. They were worried about the financial impact. Remember, it was not just the cotton plantations that profited from slavery. Whether you're talking about the banks uh, or the insurance companies, uh, the railroads, even the newspapers, the fact is that almost every aspect of the American economy was at some level or another invested in the slave business. You also need to recognize that for the wealthy elitist who controlled this system, slaves were an asset as long as they were slaves. But at the moment they are set free, they become a liability. And what the elite knew was that the end of slavery would instantly release four million people into the economy who had been kept uneducated and effectively unemployable anywhere but the cotton field. And what they were concerned about was that this was going to bankrupt the American economy. Taxes were going to go through the roof to take care of these people. Crime was going to be rampant. The prisons were going to be flooded. There was going to be this population overrun. And in the North, the biggest fear was migration from the South of these black people. The other fear that these people had was intermarriage between blacks and whites would lead to a loss of racial purity. The question was, what were they going to do about it? And their initial thought was that they would just send all the slaves back to Africa. This plan was called colonization, and it had broad support among the wealthy elite. In fact, the American Colonization Society was even funded by the United States Congress. 
But in the end, colonization proved to be unworkable and the idea was eventually scrapped. But about that same time, a new philosophy was emerging in the world. It was called eugenics. And for some, it seemed like the perfect solution to, had, to what had become known as the Negro Dilemma. I do not join in the belief that the African is our equal in brain or in heart. And I believe that if we can, in any fair way, possess ourselves of his services, we have an equal right to utilize them to our advantage. Francis Galton, 1857. Francis Galton is known as the father of eugenics. He actually coined the phrase eugenics. So he believed in trying to increase those he felt were superior in stock and decrease those he felt were inferior. Francis Galton came from a very wealthy family, a family that made its wealth from the slave trade. And what a lot of people don't know is that Francis Galton was a cousin to Charles Darwin. Francis Galton took Charles Darwin's philosophies and ideas and thoughts and he actually put them into practice and that's what we know today as eugenics. Eugenics and evolution are related in that they both see what they consider to be the um, highest form of primate, such as the gorilla, as almost indistinguishable from what they consider the lowest form of human, the African and the Aborigine. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Charles Darwin, 1890. Charles Darwin is very well known for writing uh, The Origin of Species in the 1800s. This book gave rise to evolutionary theory. What people don't know is that there was actually uh, a longer original title to this book, and that was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, uh, copies and editions that they made afterwards eliminated that phrase about the favored races. Evidently, they understood then that it was politically incorrect. Some may defend Francis Galton because eventually that he rejected slavery, but uh, they do point out that all of his wealth did derive from the slave trade, but also it needs to be known that he, as well as other eugenists, did not reject slavery until after it had ended and they could not any longer exploit blacks legally. So at that point, it would have been quite easy for he and uh, his cohorts to uh, reject slavery. I think this is a point that we all have to really realize that the eugenics movement was not uh, invented by the everyday average uh, white American, but by a select group of wealthy, white elitists that had often uh, used uh, this ideology to pit all of white America against black America. And so we see that indeed that truly is the case even to this day. Average Negroes possess too little intellect, self-reliance, and self-control to make it possible for them to sustain the burden of any respectable form of civilization without a large measure of external guidance and support. Francis Galton, 1873. Eugenicists believed that Africans were inferior not just mentally, but physically, and that left to themselves, left alone, they would not make it. The problem is, it didn't work. With that failure, the eugenicists moved on to what is known as positive eugenics. In positive eugenics, the eugenicists wanted the white population to reproduce, to have so many children that it overwhelmed the black population. But that didn't work either. Next, they moved on to what they called negative eugenics. They knew that they could not round up all the blacks in the nation and execute them, so they decided to create an environment where they would convince the blacks to severely limit the number of children they were going to have and thereby commit race suicide. 
The problem of the socially fit must be treated not as one of color, but as a problem of the spread of feeble-mindedness. Dr. Charles Davenport, 1913, director of the Eugenics Record Office, Cold Spring Harbor, New York, and co-founder of the American Eugenics Society. 